Welcome to the Grit.org podcast with Colby Harris and Brian Harbin. In these episodes, they speak to top achievers in athletics and business to understand the habits and mindset they apply in order to build more grit. Welcome back to the Grit.org podcast. My name is Colby Harris. Alongside me, as always, is Brian Harbin, and we're here with today's guests, Paul Lohr and Hub Hupman. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. No, oh, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank oh, you. it's a pleasure to have you on. So recently, Paul, a Marine Corps veteran and Hub Navy veteran, did the unimaginable in a pursuit to help fellow veterans across the country. Alongside two other veterans, Billy Semino and Cameron Hansen, these four men rode the Atlantic Ocean. Clocking over 3,000 nautical miles in 51 days, 11 hours, and 41 minutes from Lagomera, Spain to Antigua and the British Virgin Islands. Now, let me add, these guys were not paddling 3,000 miles for cracks and giggles. The Far From Home team's mission is to raise money to help vets struggling with PTSD, identity issues, housing accessibility, and cognitive disorders, with Canines for Warriors being their go-to foundation. To date, they have raised over $900,000. Their mission started in 2019 with a vision, and these four men, all from small town Amelia Island, came together to commit and do the unthinkable. Starting December 12th, 2021 and ending February 1st, 2022, the 51 days on the water took years of preparation and purpose. We have Paul and Hup here today to share more about their row, the mission, and the grit it took to bring it all together. So to get started, just a small background on these guys. As, as mentioned, both are veterans of the respected branch and now current residents of Ferndina Beach on Amelia Island. As retired veterans, they both love their small island and the community they have there. One thing you'll come to find about them both is whether they're doing photography, surfing, playing music, or rowing an entire ocean, these guys always seem to have a smile on their face, which really makes me come to enjoy their presence the most. So without further ado, Paul, starting off with you, it was your idea initially, you were the skipper of the boat, you managed a lot of the fundraising and logistics throughout the course of the mission. Can you dive into us, you know, what, what sparked this idea? Where did it all really start for you to, to pursue this mission to, to row the ocean? Uh, so first, thanks uh, for inviting us out here, Kobe and Brian. It really is, uh, it's a, just a neat opportunity to meet your audience. I know Hup and I are really, are really excited Um, so the idea just didn't just start from me as everything, you know, everything is always a collective. Um, when I first met Billy Semino, we all found out through his family that they were trying to raise money for another veteran team who's actually going to go out and take the ocean again, uh, this year in 2022, they're called fight or die. So they were raising money, uh, uh, for them. And then Billy you know, was just talking to me one night in the bar. We were sitting there like, how can we do, uh, you know, how can we raise some money for them? So we came up with this paddle event and uh, when them through the paddle event, we got to meet the team. We got to meet one of the team members, fight or die. Uh, and then after that, we got to meet another team member when we went out and did a visit with them when we were thinking about entertaining the ocean. So that's where the genesis was from. That's where it kind of just started from. Where I kind of came into the picture was really, I just applied for their team uh, to, to row out in the ocean. And then Kobe, you know, being a surfer, I had a trip scheduled for Indonesia. So I wasn't losing that. I was going on that. That was a trip that's been planned for years. Um, and so then we just came up and said, well, Hey, why don't we row? And then the four of us knew each other, uh, just kind of in social settings and we became friends and then we became closer friends. And then we just said, Hey, you know, we had this beautiful community that we live in. How about us? You know, we could do it. We can uh, row the ocean. So that's where it just all kind of started from. That's awesome. And, you know, on that note, as you said, obviously you would now need a team. You thankfully had these three other great gentlemen around you. So, Hub, over to you. You know, how did you get roped in and and what were your initial thoughts on making the trip? Yeah, it was uh, it was really interesting because the when the guy from the other team came down, he had the shirt on that said, uh, any idiot can row an ocean. It takes a real uh, any idiot can row a boat. It takes a real idiot to row an ocean. And it was intriguing that, you know, meeting the man, and at the time, we're on the other side of it now, but at the time it was so intriguing to me, I'd never heard of this, where you could physically make your way across the ocean. And after a career in the Navy, I was really hooked. Like, I thought, this is sounds impossible. Uh, so um, when, the, when the four friends came together to form a team, it was an easy decision for me because we were already so close 
working on the the other project together with the paddle uh, it just seemed like let's take that synergy and and direct it towards a bigger cause and see what happens because we had raised a decent amount of money for that mm -hmm. that other team I, I don't recall the number 10 12 thousand yeah, somewhere in there just a little over 10 thousand so we thought you know maybe we could go for a bigger vision and see what happens with this so and i love the guys so that was it was really easy once you're you know tied into the brotherhood and the fellowship of, of veteran status together let's go let's do, let's try this yeah. yeah, if you can if you can paint the picture a little bit, you know, if you could just think about visualize four guys sitting around a table with just a pad and an idea and really what what was the bond or the glue if you want to use that as like a physical example, it really was just like what Hutt was saying. Uh, we actually physically even said that, that we wouldn't think of any other four guys that we would row across the ocean with and right. try this. So we were all really happy and content there. And it's amazing how secure that can make you feel and we ended that way that's mm -hmm. the really even neater part about it yeah. and and why rowing i mean had any of you guys done long distance rowing before or <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> uh, you know i was uh, paul's a water enthusiast as, as i'm sure you guys know from previous discussions i love the water i worked as a kayak guide and paddled we'd done a couple of trips around the island just in kayaks so we got a little little ocean time on a, a backwater kayak and I thought, you know, this is this is pretty intriguing to to take it further out and see see what's possible. So the first step was to to reach out to somebody who could teach us to row. Literally, like we've never done this. So um, one of our guys, Cameron, the Air Force veteran, is a JU alumni, and he took the lead and contacted the the row coach down there. <laughs> and I really kind of love this story too. So he reaches out, hey, my name's Cameron. I know you don't know me. I'm a JU graduate. Um, I'm one of four veterans. And we're looking for a row coach to do this charity event. And the coach is like, all right, that sounds doable. I can help you, you know, with that row thing. So, oh, by the way, we're going to row across the Atlantic Ocean. And, you know, there's that, that silence, right? Like, but then <laughs> Jason was completely on board, uh -huh. took us in and trained us up and, uh, uh, I think provided us really a great foundation to get it done. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, no experience, no experience necessary on the resume, just a big heart, right? Hmm. You got to have some heart and, and fortitude so yeah yeah if your viewers and listen again want to just kind of visualize something man it's like being like hewlett packard or i'm showing my age but apple you know like you're in a garage and you really just have a concept right and that's really what we had we just had a concept and we reached out to somebody and like hey man you know we want to do this and they're like yeah we're on board hmm. you know and it, you got all these people that don't even know each other but they're immediately saying yes and so that's, a, that's an amazing amount of really great energy Definitely. You know, to go forward. And I see, you know, passion is obviously the greatest fuel. And I can already tell both of you have a lot of passion about the project as well as just really assisting others. And especially, I think the camaraderie of it is really amazing too. So Paul, for you, again, as mentioned, the team has now raised over $915,000. So we start originally raising about $10,000 for another team. And here you guys are now almost at a million dollars for your team personally. Can you share some insight into the process and challenges, um, if any, or just overall feedback that you guys saw as you started raising money and promoting the mission and trying to just talk to more people to really make this thing possible? Yeah, so it's it was a long journey. And I'll go back and, and do a little talk story about, because um, I, I go back to when Hup and I, and, and I just say Hup and I, so it is a four-man team, but we did break down like division of labor, who would do what, you know, just so we can stay focused because it you know, you'll see at the very end, it's a huge tasking to get into ocean rowing. It's totally a different sport. There's a lot of logistics to it, a lot of uh, project management aspects uh, to it. But Hup and I, you know, in the beginning, put together a complete sponsorship package. And we really just went out to the row community to see, you know, what was out there. And we didn't plagiarize, but we just kind of did a lot of research and, and reading. And then you kind of just you know, take what you get there and you make your, you create your own shell. So Hup and I got with a bunch of other folks and we put together this, what we thought was really a cool sponsorship package. And, and at that time too, Hup and I, and both, I'm sure Cam and Billy, you know, had in their minds, you know, when we put this together, like, wow, everybody's going to come busting out of the wall, Red Bull, you know, Nike, all, all this is going to start happening. Um, you know, Adidas, you know, we're going to get all these major sponsors and, um, you know, and we noticed that once we launched and we launched really right when COVID was kind of just starting to happen, you know, just starting to happen. And I remember the story so distinctly because I was in Vietnam and Hup and I actually did a FaceTime call 
to kind of go over the package um, and say, hey, you know what, is it looking good? Can we launch it right in March? And we were like, yeah, we're good. So when I came back, we launched it and not even, I think maybe what, hop 10 days later, it, yeah. you okay. know, COVID hit. Yeah. And and that really just, you know, on, on, on top of, you know, us learning how to grab major big sponsors, you know, now all of a sudden you're in one of the biggest pandemics of your, you know, of your lifetime and, and everything is shutting down, you know, businesses are shutting down. So the long story is, and Hup and I got together and we kind of just did like a reset, like, what are we going to do? you know, really now. And and we actually took a hiatus. We said, we're just going to stop. We're not going to talk to any businesses. We're going to let families and everybody adjust and, and really just take care of themselves, you know, take care of their own right now, because none of us knew really what the landscape was, was like. So, but for us, that really kind of put us on the, on the back burner because to do ocean rowing, you need to buy a ocean rowboat, which none of us had, yeah. um, you know, so it, it, it took a lot of restructuring. You want to add a little on that? No, I, gr- I agree. I was reading ahead a little bit, you know, uh, it's <laughs> it leading into the paddle. Was there a second guess or a setback? And the first one out of the gate was COVID because, uh, you know, the, it's, it's an expensive undertaking to get started. You know, you can certainly raise enough to pay that back and, and come out even, which we've been fortunate to do, but, uh, what do you do? And, and I think that we were, um, uh, fortunate in that we because of the step back and because we were so ingrained in our own community we thought let's look locally let's let's step back and stay within our own you know circle of influence and see what's there and that actually kept kept everything breathing was to go smaller to stay Mm -hmm. home and and work with our own community and that's really what started driving everything and i think we found that accidentally i mean it was Mm -hmm. just a great pivot to say you know, there's no money out there right now that every, you know, everything's down. Uh, but locally cookies, cookie sales and bake sales and raffles that, you know, mm-hmm. and I guess it's, it's been around so long because that stuff actually works mm. once your community, once you pull your own community in. And how would I talk about, we, if we had to do it over again, you know, people always ask us this question, you know, you know, would you want to do it in an environment without COVID? And, and obviously COVID, you know, you'd, we know the ramifications that that has and we won't, but just even if it was something else, you know, we probably wouldn't go back and look for big sponsors because the community is really what reshaped our journey into something really amazing to know that you can do an extraordinary um, gesture and have love and, and folks behind you really in the hardest of times and still push forward. And I think it kind of goes towards your, you know, when we were going through your, your creed, your grid creed, right? There's one in there that talks about, I'm going to try, try and try again. Right. And that's basically really what, what we did. You know, you have to reset, you have to figure out, okay, this is the obstacle that's in front of us. And are we going to make the best of it? Or are we just going to, you know, sit down and, you know, and give up for, and then come back, or are we just going to try to reshape ourselves? And we chose to really reshape ourselves. And I think that's an important point for your you know, for your listeners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think everyone really had to do a lot of, of strategizing and going back to, you know, going back to the drawing board, just mm-hmm. as you guys said you did and, and going from, from that perspective of kind of, at this point, you want to go back and change anything else about it, which I think is really important. So thinking into the physical matter and the mental matter of how you actually did the trip I think that's a big point of you actually had to row 3,000 miles we can we can talk about the funds we can talk about getting the boat getting there uh, but then you actually had to row 3,000 miles for so for you both how did you guys try to prepare mentally and physically for 51 days on the water just with three of your uh, what I would now call some of your closest friends of course and um, how did that whole just process go down leading up to the row yeah, I yeah sure the, so uh, really just planning again uh, we're four guys uh, from 50 to 60 ish. So, you know, we're, we were all physically active. I think that fortunately we were all either playing ball. Paul's always surfing on the water. Billy's a triathlete. He runs uh, hmm. all the time. And then Cam was a kind of a, a former pro football player, semi-pro football player. So he, he's in great shape too. So we had a great foundation uh, and our physical program really was more about what's it going to take, you know, to, to, pursue that two hour shift of on and off, on and off every two hours. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't specifically geared 
more than it was really about teamwork too, about getting together, having a program that strengthened us up, created some endurance. Uh, and then, you know, it focused on different areas between some cardio, some strength training, a little bit of bulking, being able to produce a good pull. That was really key, I think, is being able to, to make the boat move, you know, as an individual, once you put everybody together, that you're getting good traction on there. So we, we teamed up with CrossFit 32034 up on Amelia Island. Uh, we had two trainers that would meet with us every Tuesday morning at 0600 <laughs> and, uh, you know, put us through their, their grind to get us strength, strength training and a little bit of bulking. And it worked for us. It wasn't, it wasn't a, I don't think it was a crazy physical program. A lot of this was on your, your own. You had to trust your teammate that they were going to put in that time, you know, outside of just that basic strength training to live on the erg. Yeah, and Live on the erg. I was going to say for for you, Paul. Um, I know there was a lot of mental training that went into it, a lot of preparation in that regard too. So, how did you guys try to you know fully prepare for the the fifty one days of almost isolation on the water? Um, so, yeah, the mental. If you talk to any ocean rower, they'll tell you that the mental aspect of the row is about eighty percent, and the physical part is about twenty percent. And I really, I don't know how you think absolutely. They're, yeah, they're definitely right on. Um, so we prepared. We ended up through an in-kind donation, Don Grant, who's a hypnotist and a mental performance uh, coach, she stepped in and provided us an in-kind donation for the whole entire team. And I know Hup and I, probably out of the four of us, really took on to it uh, the most. She would make, she would, you know, do questions about like, what were our fears? What were our concerns? You know, sometimes not even fears, but just what were our concerns? And I know Hup and I flushed out um, for me, it was cla being claustrophobic. You know, I was kind of worried about, for some reason, I just start getting in small spaces. And that little cabin, if you've never been in our boat, it's like, we, Hup and I ended up renaming it the dumpster. Um, and that's like a little four by four space. And then you have to put your legs underneath an area that maybe you might've got maybe five inches of clearance once your legs are underneath there. So, um, you know, she helped us get through that by making audio tapes, having discussions, you know, group discussions on how we're overcoming, you know, the obstacles. Um, and then Hup and I, I give us a lot of credit when we were training, we put a lot of time into being in that cabin. Any opportunity that we had, that we both had to be in there, we took that as a training opportunity. Like, well, I'll give you an example. We got into some really cold weather on our first training run uh, when we were going up towards St. Simons. So we were kind of almost in the onset of hypothermia. And we really needed to pull over because we didn't have the appropriate clothing. Um, it just really got down in the 30s uh, that night. So we found a dock and we pulled over. And again, here's that thing about trying, trying again, right? We didn't look at it as like we're failing and we needed to stop and we needed to get onto a dock. We looked at it. Okay, now we're going to get onto the dock. You know, let's just hold here and we get in the cabin and we slept the night together you know, in, in a really small space, because you've got to learn that. If we were out in the ocean and we were in, you know, major seas, like 40, 50 foot seas, and we all had to get in there, you're going to have to learn how to live in there. So that was a way of, of getting through it, just to try to th train in the actual, you know, in the actual moment. And Don, I know you captured this really well, Hub. Tell them about like how Don wants you to look at a at a situation not at as bad as that's an opportunity. Yeah, she comes at it from a different angle. It's mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example of seasickness is everybody's first concern. So Don created an audio called motion wellness, right? So it, it really gets in your head that it's okay to, to have this physical thing happening to you. And then I wish I could tell you the secret of the tape, like, <laughs> like tell you, here's how it works. But unfortunately it puts you under within minutes. And so, I don't know the whole audio stream of what she actually said, but when I woke up the next morning, I felt better or, you know, so we were all seasick a, a day out. We're, we're heading out. We're all coming to terms with the inner ear and whatever she whispered in my, in my inner ear worked. When I woke up the next day, I was already ready to eat. So, uh, it, there's some, there's tools out there that you may not know about or even trust, but sometimes you got to test them out. Something like this, you know, you could be skeptical and say, well, mental, you know, mental training, but, it really worked for me. It made it made a world of difference in that first few days. Um, yeah. You know, some teams, they, they, they can't perform because of, of the first week. They're out of it. But we were all through that pretty quickly. Yeah, there was just really a team that was on the water that had to go make a diversion to land mm -hmm. because one of the rowers, you know, got seasick. Wow. And, the, and uh, now they've stopped. And they've stopped, yeah. yeah. They've stopped because of the hurricane season. And Hup brings out a really great point, too, for your listeners, because this is kind of ties into veteran suicide. 
you know, folks that are in the military or really any high performance sports, you know, sometimes we're taught that, you know, it's, it's, it's not okay to underperform or it's, you know, but you're going to have your moments at times. You're going to be in a situation where something's not comfortable for you and it's okay to say that you're not okay. And that's what Don kind of just made us work through that. This, the mindfulness and your awareness and your acuity to what is not working for you will actually sometimes can make you perform better, Absolutely. right? Because if you recognize it and then you engage the things that will make you overcome that, you will overcome that. And that I thought was really significant that Don you know, brought out. And we actually try to bring that message now that it's okay to say that you're not okay about something. Like for me, you can, everybody out there in the audience could sit there and go, oh, he's a Marine and he's claustrophobic. You know, I'm okay with that, right? Because I put myself into that situation to train to overcome that. So the only way that I can overcome something is if I recognize it and, and try to train through it, right? It's the same thing with weights. You know, if I want to get stronger, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep yeah. training, right. right? In a certain way. So if I'm claustrophobic, I'm going to try to train myself out of that. Well, and the biggest thing too, and, and whether you're rowing across the ocean or, you know, in, in any type of sport or anything in life, really, a lot of times it's you versus you, right? Oh, and even absolutely. though you're rowing with a team, it's like so much of life, overcoming life and adversity is dealing with that voice in your head, that voice telling you, oh, you're scared of these little spaces. And such a big part of overcoming that and dealing with it is reframing how you look at it and looking at it from a different perspective. Yep. And instead of looking at it as a weakness, you now turn it into strength and something that's going to help you. Um, and once you overcome that, the confidence you get from it kind of starts this momentum. Absolutely. And um, so it's really neat that, you know, here you guys, like you said, in your 50s and 60s have overcome something that previously you thought was holding you back. But mm -hmm. now has given you guys a lot of momentum and confidence moving forward. And, and I'm sure it's probably going to inspire a lot of people too. Um, and kind of speaking of uh, overcoming adversity. So um, I know there was a bit of a hiccup when you guys were in Spain trying to get the boat through uh -huh. customs. So tell us, and the name of your boat was or er, is courageous. It's courageous. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about that story in Spain. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll take, I'll take that one. So let's set the setting first. So Hub and us, the whole team with a couple of other teams that were from the United States, were sitting at a small, uh, little cafe and we were getting ready to have lunch. We've ordered, we're all kind of sitting there, uh, joking around. Um, and I always kind of put this like, it's like in a movie that you see, like if you see somebody that's in government, high level government, and all of a sudden everybody in the room is looking at their phones because they're all getting kind of the same message. That's what was happening at our, at our table, but I didn't recognize it yet at the moment. So my phone goes off and I usually just don't always jump to the phone, but we knew that we were waiting for the boat, you know, the clear through customs. So, um, I was looking at it a lot. So here goes this message. And all of a sudden I open up my email and I, the very first lines in it is, the first line was, we've got a really big problem, you know? So now your heart starts, heart starts pumping because you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you're 6,000 miles away or however many miles away we are right now and we don't have a boat and, you know, you see this and you know where it's coming from. It's coming from the customs broker. Um, and then I'm reading it more and it had some dollar amount in there, like over $80,000 you must come up with, you know, if you want to get your boat back. And I'm like, okay, wow, what, what, what is happening? You know, this, why am I having to pay more than I paid for the boat? You know, so that, that was immediately that was going in my, so I, and that would help me kind of just discount it a little bit. Cause I was like, all right, that really ain't going to happen. You know, you can just hold on to the boat and we'll find another boat. Um, right. Try, try again. Um, but yeah, it, it really kind of just stumped us. And then finding out that the rest of my mates from the United States were also getting the same email you know, what ended up happening was in short is somewhere along the message in customs, they got that the boat was coming to Spain and was going to stay in Spain and was going to be sold in Spain. So there were a lot of duty and, and excess taxes that were going to be owed on the boat. But as time goes on, you know, we saw that message kind of dwindle down in price and it was real funny. But the main, me the main message out of that uh, whole scenario was um, we really just stayed the course as a team and we didn't get excited um, you know, about the problem, we really tried to work the problem. Mm -hmm. And again, I could tie it to one of your, uh, lines in your, your grid creed, right? Is, uh, am I, am I a problem solver? 
And that's what we all were. We were yeah. problem solvers. And then you have to find folks that can also help you because sometimes you just can't solve everything. And in that context, you know, having to work through the Spanish government and speaking Spanish and all that, we really went towards Atlanta Campaigns, who is hired to run, you know, this whole Talisker race. And really, they were the agents of change that, that we immediately shifted to and started communicating through to figure out there's got to be a way to, to solve this boat. problem because yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. there's there's 35 other boats right now sitting in the boat parking lot you know that are being worked on so and we're part of that and you know why are those 35 boats sitting there and ours are in customs and that's really the way we looked at it so and it seems it's really a an almost an uncontrollable situation even there you know and i think that's something you guys sounds like you did really well about throughout this whole process was just focus on the controllables you know if it's out of your hands it's out of your hands it's something we can't change then just as you said, just go and keep moving forward, being a problem solver, not yeah. a problem spotter. Uh, so it's really, really incredible to know that you guys just really stuck to it and, and continue to, to set it up. And sure enough, just days later, you guys were good to go. It was time to do the thing after years of preparation. So up for you, you know, I have to ask now, as you're heading out, leaving the port, you know, you get that last glimpse of land. What's that experience like when you finally started to make the trip and and you were leaving land for for you know what was going to be at least probably two months a little under two months right yeah it was really um it was really special honestly once we uh got out of the harbor when you clear lagomera and you make that trek to the <clears throat> southwest <clears throat> pardon me there's nothing more to see it's it really you, you're out you look in front of you and you see this expansive ocean uh, and that's all you're going to see for the next at least month and a half, you know. Uh, so, And then the sea starts to change as you pull away from land. What you've trained in and what you knew and what was comfortable quickly becomes uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The movement of the boat changed, the way it reacted to the waves, mm -hmm. uh, how you moved around the boat while guys were now full-time on and off, no breaks, no, you know, let's stop and talk about this. You were in it, and so you had to learn this new ballet you had to learn the new way to get around. You, you remembered, oh, hey, I haven't eaten today. You really would get mm -hmm. caught in a shift of, I got to produce power and move the boat forward. But then you'd say, I haven't fed my body. Yet. And that's, so, you know, we'd done it for a few days, ones and twos, but now it was going to be weeks, weeks. So we woke up the second morning and we saw not another person. So the first day you could see boats coming by the, the Norwegian uh, trio of gals <laughs> passed us on the right. They were all uh, ex uh, offshore rowers already. So they blew by us. And that's the last time we saw people. And when we woke up the next morning, we didn't even see boats. So um, there, the reality of it sits in really quickly. When, when you're, once you're clear and the little mountain of Tenerife disappeared behind us day three, you realized there, there was going to be nothing between there and Antigua. And what was that like for you, Paul, just to... You know, your first few days out there, even you know, dealing with motion sickness, I know everyone kind of had to deal with a little bit for the first few days. What what really occurred in those first few days as you adjusted and, and any abnormalities or things that occurred as, as you got used to being on the boat? Yeah, if you go back to my pictures, I actually took my fins and went in the water one day and went right up on the buoy that was out of the channel and took a photo of the ocean because Hup captured it so eloquently. I mean, there's really not much more to say on that. When you look out, you know, in the vast sea and you know, you know, this is it, you know, this is, you're not going to see anything for X amount of days. It's, it's pretty, uh, eye opening. It wakes you up really quick. You know, you pretty much left everything behind, you know, for a cause. And it was, but like Hub said, you know, you, you immediately will engage into all the things that you've learned during your training, you know, that you quickly have to start, you know, adjusting to, or otherwise you're not going to, you know, survive that, that, that period. And it really is really that raw. I mean, our life was about rowing, sleeping, eating, and doing boat chores. That was it every day. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the focus. And then the grounding factor, which I don't want anybody to miss out of here is our why, you know, why did four guys get in a boat, leave all their possessions behind leave all their friends and family behind. You know, why did they do that? And we did that to raise awareness that veteran suicide is a huge problem, you know, in the United States. And we are losing our sons and our daughters, our aunts, our uncles, our nieces, nephews, 
you know, whoever that connection is in your family. So that why always got us back to very quickly, I got to eat, you know, I got to be in the cabin, I got to sleep, I got to be there for my mates, I got to rest up. So when it's my turn to row, you know, I'm going to row. And then whatever our boat duties were, you know, we, that was our why, that was our fuel. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too. It's, you know, talk about fight or flight when you're in a situation like that, there's no flight, right? You have to, you have to fight. And it's similar for people going through a mental, you know, things or people, you know, at, at war. And so you have to focus on what you can control and what you guys could control was your, your schedule really. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of paint the picture as far as like just a day in the life. I know you guys had a very, you know, uh, well thought through schedule in terms of just boat maintenance, ins and outs of operating, you know, eating, rowing. So tell us a bit more about kind yeah, of the day in the sure, life. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So, you know, the, the, <clears throat> trying to get your body to shift into a cycle <clears throat> of the two on and two off, as we call it, two men rowing, two men off every two hours, 24 hours a day. Uh, it, it takes your body a few days to come to terms with that sleep cycle or lack of, I like to call it the lack of sleep cycle and, and the movement at the same time. Um, and it was anecdotally, it was funny. We would at one point lay down to take that precious hour and a half. Uh, Paul has the record 10 minutes later, he is up and opens the door and says, all right, I'm ready to relieve you. We had this turnover, formal turnover we did each time. He's like, I'm ready to relieve you. Uh, Paul, it's been 10 minutes, but your body doesn't know that you literally lay down, you, your brain clicks while you're out and then you come back up and you think it's time to go back out there. So it take it, it took a, a bit of time, a week or two to really, you know, get into some abnormal patterns that you've never experienced before. Mm-hmm. But you do learn through persistence that your body will adapt. You're living in the ocean and being exposed on that boat. Your skin started to adapt to the environment. We took on this layer of, uh, of stuff on our skin, not just salt, but you started to become kind of one with the environment. So, mm-hmm to mentally push through until you can feel those changes where if I don't like to use the word comfortable because I don't think I ever felt comfortable, but where you started to realize you became part of the bigger experience around you. That was life changing. Those, Mm -hmm. that moment where you realized your body will adapt to a new rhythm. Your cycles will become normal in time and that you'll become kind of one with, with what's going on. Yeah, I find the adaptation factor very interesting because the, the human body is really amazing in the sense of we don't mm-hmm. necessarily push it to its capabilities anymore the way we used to as, you know, I mean, shower once a day, multiple times a day, you get, you know, comfort factors indoors, all these different things. So you don't really get to be in that environment. Uh, it's really cool to hear that you guys experience that and you can even talk about the changes in your skin. So. One question I do have to ask is you guys did in fact face some pretty treacherous conditions. I know for a few days you guys were seeing 30, 40 plus foot, foot swells, you know, <laughs> for both of you, unless there's a, a shared moment, if one of you want to take it, what was the, the scariest moment or, you know, a time where things really got a little nerve wracking as to, you know, the, the finish line might seem a little farther, farther than you guys had originally anticipated. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, on the trip, I can really honestly, and it's not being narcissistic on this or anything, but I just, there wasn't really a point, you know, of like scared or failure on that. Cause we just knew we were going to do whatever we had to do and whatever way it turned out, we know that we gave our best, you know, on that. So, um, it, probably if I had to capture anything, it's probably being at night, you know, being in like 30 plus foot swells, you know, that definitely, especially with minimal light. You know, you just don't see the, you know, the waves coming from, you know, where they're coming from. And, and we were in conditions where we had a lot of wave action on our beam of our boat, hitting us on the side of the boat, you know, more than in the stern. So that was probably always nerve wracking because there's that chance. We never rolled, but there's always that chance, you know, that you can roll. The boat was made extremely well from a company out of Rannoch. Uh, in England. That's where we purchased the boat from. It's an R45. And we were amazed on really how she performed, you know, out in the ocean because, you know, you always hear stories and you watch videos. and But they're normally an anomaly than it is really, you know, the, the everyday norm. Well, that was going to be my next question just real quick is, did it have, it had rolling capabilities. If you guys were to turn, what was the, what was the protocol for something like that? Yeah, to, the boat would roll. Into it? Yes. You would hold on. You know, and you're tethered in. It's a six second ride, right? We're tethered in with mountaineering harnesses around our waist and then two points on the boat all times when you're outside of the cabin. 
So the boat would go over, you would ride with it, and you'd come back up in six seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the doors were shut. Which yep. is, so every time you're out of the door, you shut the door behind you. Every, you know, you're you're in and out as quick as possible. Paul, Paul and I had a great video on that: how to make a crew change in, in three seconds. The car and compartments that. needed to be sealed. You know, if right. you compromise the compartments, then the boat performance is going to. Yeah. yeah, that's why. That's so that's why I was just trying to imagine there and, and paint the picture a little bit of, of what would occur in a situation like that. Because I'm sure I, you guys might be able to say even if there were any boats that happened to turn throughout the trip, I'm sure that might. I heard be. The, there was a duo that they ended up setting a world record. So I don't think the fact that they capsized slowed them down. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, God bless them. A team named Wild Waves. These girls were full of energy. They they had a capsize yeah. uh, towards the end, but they uh, flipped right back up and just yeah. kept going. I, I personally think it would have been a little chaotic. That there's so much going on on deck and pieces and parts of what's everything's tethered to the boat. But uh, to flip over and then you're outside the boat technically when the, you're you're still attached, but you're outside. You got to get everybody back in. There's injuries that you know that's where you really could probably get hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a gentleman that started uh, who fell and uh, broke his elbow. When the race started, and he uh, unfortunately was only 40 miles out, but they were able to get him in his boat mm -hmm. back in. But um, yeah, that's where the injury yeah. can happen. A lot and that chaotic happens. Right. That's what yeah. I was going to say. A lot can happen. I feel like just in that brief six seconds, even a lot can happen in yeah. six seconds. But yeah, you could kind of do it almost like surfing, right? I mean, you get caught underneath the wave. You got your leash to your board, you know, and you've got yeah. those moments where really, if you just choose your mind again, train your mind to relax and, and trust that the boat's going to roll back over, you know, you'll just snap back with the boat. But like Hub said, probably the bigger part of it is really not the rolling. It's all the thrashing and stuff that went on. Cause if you don't mind, just, we actually almost rolled when we were training, we were in the coming in just South of the Tybee inlet, um, over by Wilmington, Georgia. And we were coming in the inlet about one o'clock in the morning, we got caught on a shawl and we were really at a 90 degree angle on the boat. We ended up snapping two oars, and so you've got all that weight, you know, that's on that boat. So it's really what's flying around is probably the most dangerous than just actually being underwater and, mm -hmm. you know, snapping back. You just yeah. hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so as for the physical exhaustion of doing the paddle, like you said, two hours on, two hours off. Uh, paddling hours on end every day, minimal sleep. I find it interesting too, there's various <laughs> research done on ways to sleep. And I've actually met people before that do four hour intervals. So it's kind of interesting to hear about your two hours because essentially you guys had did, as you said, just, but covering roughly 70 miles a day, no real on land training could have prepared you guys for what you were in for. Was there ever a time that your bodies did start to feel as if they were shutting down or you know, it really just became a, your physical health kind of started to become a problem or was that something you guys just overcame? Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we just, uh, rolled into the, to the physical changes. We, we could feel it. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a lady doing a study when we started, she measured our muscle mass in our, in our uh, calves, <laughs> our thighs and our pecs. And she said, you know, good luck guys. When you come back, most of these are going to be gone. And we actually hadn't thought about that part. I mean, we, we knew we had to eat to sustain caloric intake, but actually you're so physically on game for 12 hours a day, it starts to eat your own body. And I don't think we, we actually had processed that part until we got out on the boat and started to physically see each other just stripping away as you were going. Uh, but I never felt physically unable. I just felt like um, as long as I kept eating and kept nutrition in the body, the body would keep going. And I, you know, I suffer from some lower back stuff and joints and stuff. I never felt that out there. I just kept fuel in the tank and just kept moving. And I think if you keep moving and you push through it, that that's where the success is that under, like you said earlier, you, your body is capable of things that you don't realize. And it's not just superhuman strength. It's about in, endurance is, can be a low level thing for a long period of time, right? As long as you make your knot, your one knot, which is what a human can produce, you're being successful for the team and you just keep pulling. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it's very similar to like a runner's high, you know, when, oh, once yeah. they get into mm -hmm. that pace and they feel yeah. like quitting, once you break that barrier, there's really no other option than to just keep pushing almost is start yeah. to enjoy it, start to kind of embrace the suck. So to say, while yeah, you're on there, the one thing we yeah. also didn't, uh, we lost weight in our glutes and then your bones uh, from your hips, just started digging into those seats. We had double yoga mats and mm -hmm. anything we can think of short, of a, short of a sheepskin. Uh, and then those bones, just bone on skin grinding. Mm. 
Uh, and the last week and a half was just so physically uncomfortable. But you knew you were so close that you just you just pushed through it, yeah, pushed through yeah. the pains, as they say. Is there yeah. anything you want to add on there, Paul? Uh, I could, just... We could just throw some stats on there, which are always fun. Everybody likes to hear, so I use mine. Um, I started out when I was training at like 222. When I hit uh, Lagomera and got on the scale, I was 205. And then when I hit Antigua, I was 161 pounds. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and I haven't seen that weight since elementary school <laughs> or like junior high school. So, yeah, you know, you're winning away. But like what Huff said, though, is really critical. You know, you trained and we had our CrossFit training and and we held true to, to about even stretching. You know, we got word on the boat about doing calf raises. So we were doing calf raises. We were doing yoga on the boat. And I'll tell you what, man, people are right. It works. If you stick to the routines... And, and, and like Hub was saying, fuel your body, no matter what it is that's going to make you eat, and then do the stretching and, and keep your mind strong. It's amazing what the human body and human mind can, you know, can really go through. And I think we were a testament to that. I mean, I'm almost 60 years old. So if I had to change one thing, I probably would have started bulking up um, a little bit earlier. I think mm -hmm. I would have thrown on some more weight going out in the row. I would have tried to get myself back in the 220s, 230s for as much cool. as I dwindled away. A little yeah. extra beef on yeah, that. Yeah, well, like, uh, and we honestly yeah. adapted in that element too. Like I, I was really uh, strict about eating my food. You know, I just, food became a thing for me. And then Paul would say, oh, I don't really like this. And I'm like, I'll eat that. <laughs> you know, I just kept, I kind of kept eating whatever I get my hands on and I still lost 28 pounds. But, you know, I just, I made food like became a pleasure thing for me. Like that's all you got is this granola bar and some, you know, yeah, some, yeah. And be careful of prunes. Don't eat prunes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I, gotta be, I gotta be honest with you there. It's, <laughs> If you need your system flushed, I have some prunes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had a, a bag, of mixed, <laughs> bag of mixed fruit at night, and I ate the whole bag. And then the next day, I, I, I got completely flushed <laughs> wow. because of the there were mostly prunes <laughs> in that bag of yeah. fruit. Long day for everyone. <laughs> so, my, so my nickname was Gunny Goes A Lot. And then I think Hub got that one day, man. He got a good dose of, oh my. of, what, uh, of what it really means to be Gunny Goes A Lot. Oh, no. my. So I have to ask, okay, so 51 days later, you're physically half the man you used to be almost, right? Because yeah, yeah. you've lost all this body weight. Mentally, you're tough as nails, yeah. um, but hanging on by a thread. But tell us about that feeling when you first see land and you guys are, you know, within striking distance of, of getting there. Tell us that emotional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're so low to the water that you really can't see land until about 12 miles out. So we were uh, into the day, the, f the final day before we saw land. So day 51, uh, we're heading in, and about 12 miles out, you could just make out this faint outline. But you could actually, and Cameron tells us, so I'm gonna share it with you, you could smell it before you could see it. Mm -hmm. Because of whatever's going on in the island and the wind, you know, the breeze coming out, you could, you could see, and then you started to see the shade of green. And you hadn't seen the color green in a month and a half, and so it becomes very stark contrast to the horizon. And uh, your brain starts to remember, oh, that's what green looks like. And then we had some difficult weather coming in on that last day. Mm -hmm. So we really were a little, little behind where we thought. We thought 5 p.m., 6 p.m., but suddenly it was 8, 9. It's dark now. The sun has gone down. And uh, so it disappeared on us again, technically. You know, we saw it. We knew where we were headed. And then it became navigating lighted buoys because it, it got away from us. But, man, that I can't tell you emotionally how what that spike felt like, but it was the biggest adrenaline slash joyfulness I've ever felt in my life was where today I'm going to set foot on land again and be back home with my family and, you know, all the things I missed and it was right there. So that, that feeling is, is amazing. Hmm. Yeah. I can't describe it. You want to add on to that, add, Paul? Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, I just, yeah, it, it, it is something you like to talk about. Each one of the rowers really do love to talk about because, you know, to be out there for 51 days and as much as we love each other, you know, you're seeing four guys after a while. I was like, hey, you know, uh, and to see the outline, because we had to make a call. We had to make a 20 mile call to the campaign, to the race officer. Um, and when we made that 20 mile call, we still couldn't see land. So that was pretty weird. You know, it was like, and it's hard to explain to your listeners because, you know, we felt it, but it's, it's weird when you're haven't seen land but now you're making this 20 mile call. You're only 20 miles away. We thought even when we were hundred miles away, like, wow, we're really close, right. but it took forever just to get to that 20 mile mark. And then we're making it and we're telling Ian, who's the safety officer, really phenomenal man. 
Um, we don't see the land yet, you know, but then all of a sudden, four miles later, you know, now we're seeing the land and it was just really that, that exhilarating, mm. you know, just to, st and again, I think the part of it is, and Brian, you were starting to travel there is it's all about work, right? I mean, here's four guys that didn't have a boat, didn't know how to row, didn't even have oars, you know, and now we just took, however our route was, we just took a boat under power of human spirit and physical strength along with nature and we went off the coast of Africa and we are looking at our you know our final it's I won't even call it our final destination but a mark that was in our journey you you if you put it in that kind of context it's it's just it's it's amazing and it was fueled by a community and please don't ever miss that piece that you know the community that was there in Antigua and the community that was doing the watch parties on Amelia Island. And even we started hearing even in all over the country, you know, people that were doing our followers, folks that were at home and having maybe, you know, 12 people in their living room, you know, watching. It's, it, if I can. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. thought I was gonna go through the interview and not cry. Um, <laughs> But if, if you can go through something like that, I mean, I don't ever want to negate, you know, your family, your children are the best things that ever happened in your life. But I will say that just is right there at the edge, man, because it's it was pretty magnificent, you know, to know that we accomplished something like that. And that's that's the message we want to put out to our veteran community, too, that, you know, dreams and hopes and, and, and things that you fail at don't stop and, and get to that tomorrow um, because, you know, tomorrow might be different you know yeah. could have a lot of success could have a lot of failure yeah too but it also will you know will change at some point mm -hmm. yeah and you really just kind of foreshadow what i wanted to talk about next i mean after just an incredible feat of perseverance and courage dedication you guys completed the paddle and i love how you mentioned that when you landed in antigua it wasn't necessarily your final stopping point it was your destination where you guys were trying to get to but that wasn't where it all started or wasn't where it all stopped pardon me so now looking back on the trip as you just kind of touched on a lot of it there you know what has it meant to you both to complete the trip raise an air raise awareness for veteran suicide and really just make the impact that you guys have made up to this point get up yeah i think that uh the success of the whole mission uh and then bringing the community along with us uh, made it something so much bigger than what we thought it was going to be. You know, this uh, the, we had the, the physical journey, but our entire community made a difference. And, and I think that's the most feedback I get from the community was, thanks for taking us along. You know, we were fortunate to send back some video and, and, and stuff along the way. And so they all felt like they were part of what was going on without the being involved in the physical movement. So... Um, I think the success lies in the people around you. I really think that even if you're going to set off and conquer a mountain as an individual, that you're still going to need your community, your friends and followers, and the love and support. That's really where the success comes from. So um, I think that that's important to remember when we do these extreme events or anything uh, in, in the endurance category is surround yourself with, with great love and, and support, and you're going to be successful, I mm. believe. Yeah, I mean, the part I love the most is, think about right now, 15 years, you know, where are you, where are you gonna be? You know, because 15 years ago, I would have never imagined that I'm gonna be sitting here in a podcast room, you know, talking to you to find gentlemen and along with my partner that I rode across an Atlantic Ocean with. And I thought of that, I think of that a lot at the most arbitrary spots. The other day I'm in the shower, I'm just taking a shower and I'm thinking to myself, how did I meet Billy, Cam, and Hup? And, and, and then last night, I thought of it even more. I'm, I'm at dinner with a friend, and they gave me a picture of the four of us with our hands together coming off the boat. And I'm thinking to myself, where, where did I ever, where would I have ever imagined that that would have happened? You know, and so... Uh, dreams come true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, but I guess what I'm trying to say, not very eloquently and crying through it is you just never know where you're going to be, you know, 12 years from now. You just, you just don't know. But 
the one thing that is going to deliver you to a spot to where it's going to be so magnificent. It's just like what Hub said. You're not going to do it by yourself. You got to do it with others. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I actually had uh, seen that newspaper clipping this morning, was looking at that of you guys getting off the boat, you know, holding hands at it dark outside. And, you know, it, tell us now kind of where you're at in terms of total amount raise and, and what you guys are doing. Like you said, I know a big part of this was in, involving the community and, and raising that awareness to veteran suicide. What's, you know, what, what are you guys planning to do with that? And what's kind of been the feedback that you've gotten so far? In the veteran yeah, community. we're we're driving on. I'm I'm yeah. happy to say that you know it, originally we envisioned that we'd get home and you know kind of taper it off you know within a 30 day period, but I think it still has synergy and it's still rolling. So we're going to keep working that campaign until we we feel that we've actually run out of some the gas there. But people are still involved. Now we're going to make presentations about what we did and the journey, and then people are continuing to present some some thank you support on the on those events and i think we just keep pushing paul challenge the other day and i loved it because paul's full of surprises paul put <laughs> a challenge out there the other day and said hey we're actually now only you know two hundred thousand short of a second kennel which is made so yeah, i know we didn't talk mega kennel yet but a big chunk of what we did went to build a facility that will train and house dogs right on the canine for warrior campus so again think back we were we were originally just going to train a few dogs four dogs a hundred thousand something like that was our our vision but in the end, the mission and the community ended up building an entire mega kennel that will train 64 dogs a cycle. I believe it's twice a year. So 150 dogs a year now are going to roll through the courageous kennel down on the Canines for Warriors campus. And, you know, our community built that. And so we're close to, you know, pushing on to try to build a second one. Mm. Yep, we'll just keep, keep focus and uh, see how that goes. Yeah. And then Paul has some other exciting news about somebody that came to us to use Courageous for another another purpose. Oh, it yeah. keeps going on. Yeah, so, yeah, the moment I got back, uh, there's a young man named John uh, Sauer, Jr. Um, he's a special Olympian athlete. Um, and the moment Hup and I got back, this young man, he's blind, um, but very passionate, uh, and now we're finding out, yeah, very passionate. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening, John, yeah, we'll row any ocean with you. Um, he wanted to go to church like the next day. We haven't even been back like, you know, not even 24 hours, you know. And so definitely it was like, yeah, yeah, we'll meet up, we'll go. And, and then after church, you know, he's like, oh, I want to meet up with you again because I want to talk to you about something. And then it was really about, hey, I want to row an ocean. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this young man and I'm like, wow, I'm digging this. You know, let's, uh, let's talk, but let's talk with your dad, you know, too. <laughs> oh, let's fold your dad into the conversation. Cause you know, just like we were explaining before, rowing an ocean is, is, is a very physical feat, but it's also a logistics uh, piece that's got to be put together very, you know, pretty methodically. Um, anyway, but long story short, Hup and I um, are now working with, uh, John Sawyer uh, Jr. and, and Sr., uh, the Double Johns, and we're going to do a little mini coastal road to raise awareness for Special Olympics Florida. And the main, um, the main theme on that, too, is about inclusion, um, about having everybody included in, you know, in an activity, really no matter anybody's abilities, mm -hmm. that you can adjust. And I think Hup and I learned a big lesson when we went out the other day. We did our first actual on the water with Courageous um, with both Johns and Hup and I uh, to go out and, and, and see what it's like to have somebody that can't see now function on an ocean rowboat and what we have to do. And we're not going to look at it as obstacles. It's a matter of, okay, what it has to just be done differently. You yeah, know, what are the abilities mm -hmm. and how do you work around the, the abilities he mm -hmm. has? How do you exploit those for the benefit of the bigger team? The mm -hmm. controllables. Again. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The controllables again, right? Attacking the problem, not, not looking at the limitations. And just look like veteran suicide, Hup and I really, and the guys, Billy and Cam, we really took a high passion about to rewrite the narrative about veteran suicide. And we're not saying that we didn't like anything about like the number 22 or anything like that, but we always felt like, well, 22 told us what the problem was, but it really doesn't talk about how significant the problem is or the solutions, you know? So it would be just like this with inclusion. You know, we we found now trying to write like little pieces for for John, you know, to get awareness going. It's it's hard using that word disability because, really, people aren't. I mean, 
disability to me, I just don't like the word. Yeah, it's right, just, yeah. they have certain abilities, right? Their abilities are different than ours. It's focusing on the negative versus yeah, right, the yeah. positive. That's going right, back yeah. to the, right, you know, what Don Grand was yeah. kind of making us focus on is that, right. you know, here's the, here is your situation, you know, and how are you going to make it work? So John is blind, yes, but how are we going to still row in an ocean? How can we be, you know, successful? And I'm sure we're going to, in a short period, you know, go, ooh, whoa, we didn't think of that or. Yeah, but, there's things to learn mm -hmm. again. Yeah, so, tell them about the oars, huh? like, like. Yeah, so just, you know, in normal ocean rowing, when it's dark for us, there was an issue where you can't see, you know, your paddles, and so we had some reflective tape close to our hands so we could see that, and we knew the paddles were in the right direction. But in John's case, it's always dark; he can never see the paddle. So uh, we're going to adapt some some textured tape instead of reflective doesn't work for him, but textured tape so he can feel on his thumbs that the paddles are in the right direction. And then he'll know he's always, you know, set and ready to go. So adapt and overcome. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I so. love... I know I was so excited to see the announcement on Facebook that you guys were working with John, just because I think what's most interesting about your story is now, even when we talk about it, and I will note these two guys, I mean, you guys have become local celebrities, if I will say. I mean, it's... Uh, no, I love... No, I, no. It's pretty much everywhere we go, even um, when we were working on playing the episode and me and Paul went and got coffee together, I don't think it took two seconds of Paul walking in the door for five people to come up, say, Hey, you know, how happy they are to see him, how happy that he's back. And I love that you guys have never wanted the credibility. You've never wanted to be the names. You know, of course it's always been the mission, but now that it's leading you guys to helping someone on their path and, and helping them overcome something that they might not see as possible. What started as a mission, a mission to raise awareness for veteran suicide has now led to you guys just inspiring people and showcasing what's really possible. And yeah. that even comes down to John, that comes down to myself. I think Brian, everybody that's had a chance to, to hear your story is just really, really incredible. So I've really appreciated hearing from your perspectives just the way you viewed the trip because again i think I, I love the idea that it comes back around to the mission that you guys have stood for and the why behind all of it so i just have one more question for you guys as we ask all of our questions or all of our guests this question but what part of the grit creed resonates most with you guys i know you've enjoyed a lot of parts <laughs> of it obviously it applies to yeah. a lot of the trip considering what you guys really did arguably has taken the most grit of any guest we've had on so far, not to discredit anybody else, but I think they would say the same if they tried to comprehend spending 51 days on the war. So nonetheless, what part of the great creed resonated most with you guys and why would that be? Yeah, I, I like the part of the creed that uh, brings in the, what's called the serenity prayer traditionally. It's a tool that I've used my whole life, honestly, and that it's just so powerful. If, if you learn to mentally accept the things that you cannot change, come to terms with that. And then realize that a little bit of courage can help you change the things that are in your own power, right? One step at a time. And then the wisdom to know the difference, right? The, we can go back to the podcast and find every time the adversity came up, we'd pivot. That's the wisdom to know the difference, to take a different tack, to take a different a, a avenue of success. So uh, to me, that's a really powerful uh, couple lines there. And, and I'm glad to see it in your creed. It's, that's one you can carry your whole life. Mm -hmm. oh, that's beautiful hub yeah, I like it for me um, I picked I'll lead by example because the purpose is is bigger than me and the and the reason I picked that is because like folks will look at that and you have to actually think that you have to be perfect all the time like right when you hear that I'm going to lead by example but there's going to be times where I know I, I, I'm probably leading and I'm not doing a really good example about it, I might fail or something might come up, but that is going to be okay because I'm going to recognize it and then I'm going to try again. Because um, I think we've talked about this, that our society really lays heavy expectations. You know, and your expectation doesn't mean that you have to be perfect all the time when you're trying to lead or you're trying to do something or you're trying to accomplish something. Um, but the example really will be Where's the fortitude to come back at it again, to learn what you did wrong? Like, wow, that was not really a good way to lead. You know, that was not a good decision. And, and to have that fortitude and to shed, you know, your ego and say, I'm going to come back at it again and I'm going to try again to do it. And I think Hup and Billy and Cam and I uh, really set the example on that a lot in front of our community. We really, by doing this, put ourselves you know, really out there. And I think Kobe too, the reason I think, you know, folks are 
feel that he isn't coming up to us is because we have done that. Yeah. You know, humility, that humility, humility is important mm -hmm. on the backside of this. You know, and it, there's sometimes they say, don't believe your own stuff. Well, we, you know, the four of us got across together. And so when you come home, humility is key. Uh, to, and I really just keep putting the credit on the community too, because, you know, we, again, we did something physical. They did something incredible. Yeah. So. And what's the expression you guys use? It takes, it takes, takes an, an island, island across an ocean. There it is. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. Love that, that part. Love Happy to be love a part so of that sure. island yeah, community. Yeah. That's uh, copyrighted too. and uh, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> what a great expression. Yeah, no, it. it is. It is, well, but yeah. it's a testament. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really there's just community. And it really wasn't just, a, I think the key thing is when, when folks or any organization or any, high figure uses a slogan and all that, it has to live. Mm -hmm. It has to be a living, True. tangible uh, slogan. Otherwise, it doesn't mean nothing. Right. And that one lives, I know that for a fact. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it will live on for a very long time. So for all of our listeners, if you want to keep up with Paul and Hub, you can check out their Far From Home Facebook website, as well as keep up with John and their next journey. Uh, I'm sure they would like to thank everyone that support them this far, the Talisker Whiskey Challenge as well. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming on, sharing your wisdom, inspiring so many people from myself to Brian to grandparents to people around the island. Just again, the impact you guys have had near and far has been incredible to see. So again, I really appreciate you coming out. And you know, all in all, that's a wrap for us here today at the Grit.org podcast. Please check out our other episodes. Leave us a comment. Tell us something you enjoyed about the Far From Home project. Share this with someone you think it would resonate with. As always, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the Grit.org podcast.